Should, we, should I still aim to try and finish by 1130 or? You can take an extra five minutes. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, those are some pretty great talks. Uh, big shoes to fill. So I think t this last one here, it's going to be mostly uh, giving you a pretty high overview of aviation space medicine. There's a lot of details that we could go into, but I tried to make it as relevant as possible to internists, but then hopefully also a little interesting. So let's see here. So I've got no disclosures uh, or conflicts of interest. Um, the learning objectives for today, it's again, going to be a bit of an overview of the field, but going to delve into some of the medical considerations for traveling to and living in microgravity. Uh, but then also want to make sure that if this is interesting to you, that I provide you with some resources to learn some more, because there's a lot uh, it's a small field, but there's actually a lot out there. So first things first, going to kick it off with a poll. For those of you back from your bio breaks, going to ask you if you could travel to space, uh, would you, if given the opportunity? A, sign me up. I'm leaving right now. I'm not even going to finish the seminar. Uh, B, ask me again when I'm an attending. Money's a bit tight right now. Or C, I'll wait for a commercial flight, just not the first one ever. Uh, D, I don't do heights. This sounds way worse. And E, no way. I saw aliens. Give you a few seconds to share your your space adventures and adventures. All right, let's see here. Oh, we got a bit of a spread. Uh, so we got some folks that are throwing the, their laptop in the garbage, running out the door, heading into the spaceship, and in others that are well probably wiser and not trying to get eaten alive by aliens. So. Just good to know our, the audience here. We got some uh, things to review, though. Aviation itself has been around for a while, but maybe not as long as you might think, given how commonplace it is these days. Uh, so 1903, the Wright brothers had their first flight in Kitty Hawk using that contraption there that to me looks more like a kite than it does a plane, but it technically flew. Uh, and then just about 10 years later, World War I saw the use, some use of airplanes, but you can see how much has changed over those 10 years. Uh, planes are smaller, they're made out of metal, they still have that two-wing design, uh, but they can technically go higher, farther, further, faster. Uh, and then not too long thereafter, you had uh, 1927, Lindbergh flew the first nonstop flight from New York to Paris. Uh, cramped up in his own little plane by himself, um, but did it a little bit of a kind of, I don't know, uh, personal triumph as well as a technological triumph. Around the same time, you had the School of Aviation Medicine was founded by the Army. Uh, there was the first textbook in this area. The first professional organization was formed, the Aerial Medical Association. So a lot of things were happening in that field as the technology was advancing, uh, but still using propeller planes. Uh, World War II uh, saw a lot more, uh, I guess, technological use for airplanes and demonstrated a greater lift capacity and flight duration, but you could just see how much had changed over just uh, 30 to 40 years there between people flying for the very first time and then flying um, in, in such capacity. Uh, but then just a few years later, Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier, which was a very large technological feat. Uh, he's seen there posing next to his plane. Uh, around this time, too, you started having the first commercial jet airliners, so that made it a lot more easy uh, or accessible to do transatlantic flight. First regular service across the ocean was in the late 50s, uh, so you can imagine a lot more people were piloting, flying, so a lot more considerations for the impacts on health. And around the same time, too, the aviation medicine uh, specialty became a board certification, so this was just in the 1950s. 1960s saw a lot of space. You got Yuri Gagarin was the first human in space, first human in orbit, and then Alan Shepard and John Glenn shortly thereafter for America. Uh, and in 1969, just 66 years after the Wright brothers, we have Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepping foot on the moon, um, which is pretty crazy to think about it. Um, I think since a lot of this happened before we were around, it's easy to just kind of look at this and be like, yeah, that happened or, or not, I guess, depending on your perspective. Uh, but yeah, that happened. Uh, but you don't stop and think that there were people watching this that were born in a time that aviation did not exist. Uh, so you can imagine the excitement and just the rapid pace of development over those years. Uh, in the interim, there's been a lot in the low Earth orbit, LEO or LEO, uh, including the space station uh, and a lot of things that I skipped here, but the space station was launched in the late 90s. 
uh, and it has now had 21 years of continuous human occupancy. So for the last 21 years, every human being alive has not been living on the earth at the same time, which is kind of wild. Uh, and just to give a sense of perspective, this is the completed space station with its uh, solar panels out um, larger than the size of a football field. So it, it's huge, uh, but didn't start out that way, grew module by module. So, all right. So that's aviation. Uh, aerospace medicine itself, uh, it's defined or its mission is the determination and maintenance of health, safety, performance of persons involved in air and space travel. Uh, and that's the logo there for the American or the Aerospace Medical Association. You don't have to be a physician to be a part of this. They actually have a lot of different professionals uh, and scientists, including non-medical professionals, physiologists, engineers, psychologists. Uh, and some of the unique aspects of the environment for people that are exposed to um, like aviation space travel, you have excessive G forces or acceleration forces, uh, you have hypoxia, hypercarbia situations, so equivalent to say altitude or sudden say pressure loss in a cabin or a cockpit. Uh, you've got undersea medicine, dive medicine, atmospheric flight uh, is the majority of the case, and then you also have space travel or microgravity. Uh, and there's a lot of considerations for every aspect of these things and others, which I'm not highlighting here. So it's a pretty broad definition for the organization. So you hear that, you're super excited. You're saying, sign me up. How do I get there? Uh, so it's actually an ACGME accredited subspecialty in preventive medicine, uh, which in and of itself maybe is not uh, a field that's grown much over the past few years. Uh, but this fellowship still exists and has kind of been growing over the last few years itself. So a lot of people go into it after other specialty training. So the uh, majority is emergency medicine or internal medicine, but they've got, I think, neurologists uh, and a gynecologist, a general surgeon, just a wide variety of folks that have gone through this sort of training. Uh, it's a two-year degree uh, or two-year training rather with an integrated master's of public health. Uh, there's some coursework for that component of it, since there's a lot of policy involvement, so there's a lot of population studies, um, but there's also a lot, obviously, that's specific to those unique environments in aviation and space, including some practical experiences uh, from the space side of things through NASA and some others. Uh, and their phrase historically has been that you're dealing with a normal physiology in an abnormal environment. Uh, although this is changing a lot too, actually, as commercial space is growing over the last few years, you have more people with abnormal physiology in an abnormal environment. Uh, training options as a civilian UTMB that's in Texas is uh, available as well as Mayo Clinic. Um, they also have training through the military, Air Force, Navy, and Army all independently train folks in aviation and space medicine. You can imagine they have a lot of aviation in particular. Uh, King's College of London uh, has recently opened up a program as well. And then people often go out to work uh, for the military, for training in the military, FAA or the Federal Aviation Administration, um, NASA or contractors if you're interested in space. There's also, again, a growing number of opportunities in the commercial sector, including SpaceX and Virgin Galactic, who hire doctors, uh, as well as Boeing, uh, and then a few other commercial travel agencies. Uh, one of the niche things sometimes you can get involved with some cool projects uh, was this is the Red Bull Stratos uh, project where Felix Baumgartner took basically a very high tech hot air balloon up to 24 miles of elevation that's five and a half times as high as Everest, and he jumped out of that cockpit and parachuted down which is kind of wild. Um, so you can imagine that when you're that high up air is not, I mean. There's, there's hardly any air. Uh, there's also not really any pressure to make sure you don't pop as a human being. Uh, it's very cold. So there's a lot of extreme, extreme environments. They're very similar to space, although it's not technically high enough to be in space. Uh, but this is the capsule that he ascended in on the left. And this is what his suit looked like on the right. So capsule here, suit here. This looks a lot like a space suit. It's got to provide the pressure to keep him from, um, well, in a sense, boiling off at that high altitude and low temperature, but it's also got to maintain its body temperature, maintain the gases going in, oxygen, but then also dealing with the carbon dioxide coming out. Uh, and then there's also some things in here, it can't quite make out, but altimeter and some other uh, tools to help with his diet, which was his main mission. So there's a lot of things for health, uh, but there's also a lot of things unique to the mission, but you can imagine 
that a lot of the physiology and considerations of aviation and space medicine were integral into making this as safe of an experience as possible for this gentleman. And, and I believe he exceeded 800 miles an hour in his free fall before ultimately pulling his parachute. So hit some records that I, some of which have actually been broken since, but pretty incredible. All right, so that's a quick and dirty view of aerospace medicine. Uh, there's so many other things I could tell you about, but I figured it'd be more interesting if we go into kind of a case-based approach to demonstrating some of the physiologic and pathophysiologic considerations. So I'm introducing Dr. Aster Knott. Uh, Aster is a UW biologist. She's been really interested in space her whole life, and she's applied to be an astronaut several times. Like most people, it's taken several times before she was finally accepted, and she is super excited. Now that she's an astronaut candidate, there's an extra few years of specialized training to finally enter the astronaut corps uh, and be available to select for a mission. Uh, that can also take several years before you're assigned to a mission. Uh, and in this case, she's ultimately assigned to a mission on the International Space Station, and she remembers that her UW PCP way back when was you, and that you were going off to become a flight surgeon, and now that she's assigned to a mission, she can pick her doc. So congrats, she picks you, it's exciting. Good longitudinal care there. Um, there's going to be a lot of mission specific stuff, but she's also going to be getting trained and exposed to a weightless environment, such as on these parabolic flights. Um, and then she's also going to get wilderness training, uh, say shown here. This is a Russian wilderness survival training. Um, it's This one's in the winter. Uh, because if you're landing and there's an issue and your capsule ejects and you land in the middle of Siberia, you need to be able to survive for at least a few hours, a day or two before someone can come and recover you. So they go through this sort of training, harsh environment, austere environment. Uh, but then there's also training for the acceleration forces. Uh, this is a, let's see if this is going to show. Oh, it is planned. So this is a, a little animation of someone in the centrifuge, the European Space Agency. Uh, you can't quite tell looking at the picture of this person, uh, but he is currently experiencing eight Gs of gravity, eight times Earth gravity of accelerative forces, an equivalent of 720 kilograms of weight. Um, and somehow he doesn't look like his face is melting off, but you can imagine that's some pretty extreme forces that would knock out most people, especially if you're not trained to adapt to it. But these are the kind of accelerations that people experience in launch and re-entry. Uh, when they're going to space. So pretty extreme, but pretty relevant to her training. And you as a doctor are going to be there throughout all of this to try and help her, uh, well, support her health and keep her as safe as possible. All right. So Aster, uh, like all of the astronauts that are going on spacewalks, does all of her training for that in NASA's neutral buoyancy lab, uh, shown here. This is a very large pool, and you might be able to see some structure down here in the water. Uh, that's actually an external or exterior facsimile of the space station. So people will get in diving suits. They're retrofitted old or retired uh, astronaut space suits that now have an umbilical here for uh, delivering gases and so on. So you basically get in this space suit and go down and dive with a whole bunch of divers and you simulate a repair that or installation or whatever it is that you may be doing when you're on the space station. So that way, the first time you're experiencing uh, something like weightlessness or being in the suit is not when you're dangling several miles above the earth and uh, all the, everything's on the line. So you, they do a lot of dives here to kind of make it a little bit more rote uh, before they go up. So like every astronaut there, she does a bunch of these dives. She's getting really comfortable with diving in general. Uh, Aster goes off for a weekend to enjoy the coast of Mexico and goes on a dive there just for fun. Uh, she's at depth for over an hour. She's used to dives lasting several hours when she's at NASA. She doesn't think much of the time. She surfaces without an issue. Uh, but within 10 minutes, she's having severe elbow pain, back pain, maybe knee pain. Uh, and then she's also got this new rash. Um, so I want to open up a poll here at this point and ask you folks, what do you think the pathophysiology of this rash is? Uh, there's a few options. We've got eosinophil infiltration, uh, mast cell activation, microbial infection. She's using equipment that she borrowed or rented, uh, tissue hypoxia. Uh, no, there's not a whole lot to go off of there, but let me know what you think and we'll go from there. <laughs> 
All right, so we got a lot of votes for mast cell activation and tissue hypoxia. Uh, D, tissue hypoxia is the correct answer. Uh, this is a finding called cutis marmorata, uh, and it's uh, commonly seen in the bends or decompression sickness. Uh, decompression illness, however, is more of a, a larger category that includes bends or, or decompression sickness and arterial gas embolism. Uh, so the overall picture that you see clinically is you have large joint pains. Uh, you can have this skin finding here. Uh, there's also often some uh, disorientation, dizziness, nausea, uh, headache. And if you have a severe case, you can actually have stroke symptoms, spinal cord infarct. Uh, there uh, is some associated coagulopathy, but whether it ever progresses to the point where you say have uh, DIC, I, I couldn't see any evidence of that. Um, and so the overall uh, pathophysiology here, say for the arterial gas embolism, uh, when you're diving, as you go down in depth, gases will actually shrink in volume. Uh, that's Boyle's law. So as, as you go deeper, it's a higher pressure. And so for the same amount of gas at a higher pressure, it occupies a smaller space. So as you're breathing in through this tank, your alveoli are filling to the same volume, but they're actually packing more gas in there. So if you ascend too quickly or you hold your breath while you're ascending, or if you have a mucus plug, uh, you can actually get some barotrauma uh, to the alveoli, which can cause an air embolism. Uh, and that can go to say the, the brain where you can get stroke symptoms or other places. But also when you're at depth for a long time, if you're breathing air, air is mostly nitrogen. And so you get a lot of nitrogen that dissolves into the blood and just like any say soda bottle, when you open it up, you get all that gas release that's allowing the pressure out. And so uh, I think it's Henry's law. Uh, you have the amount of dissolved gas in a solution is proportional to the partial pressure above the solution. So in this case, you go to a, um, uh, like a shallower depth, lighter pressure, you start having outgassing. And like soda bottles, you know, you get that big burst of gas at first, but then you have ongoing gas formation. So it's not just a one and done type thing. It's an ongoing process until all the nitrogen is released. And you can imagine that this, if this is happening in your blood and your tissues and your joints, that it can be very painful for one. Uh, but it's um, one of the reasons why you can get some tissue hypoxia, such as with the cutis marmorata. Uh, also, interestingly, at the blood bubble uh, um, interface, you actually get activation of the coagulation cascade. Uh, there's some associated platelet uh, drop and loss associated with our consumption, rather. Um, so whether or not that actually causes, say, like risk for, say, DIC, again, I couldn't see any evidence of, but at the very least, it's thought to contribute to downstream clot formation. So you might even have issues where if you can somehow resolve the gas bubble that you still have some residual clot. Uh, so again, Boyle's Law, just wanted to point out, uh, since it's an inverse proportional relationship between gas volume and pressure, the greatest change in volume is actually nearer the surface. So a lot of these effects can actually, people dive at depth and then they start coming up and they think, oh, I'm basically at the surface, it's not that deep, but it's where you have the most rapid or significant change in volume, so you have more risk. Uh, you can also get some other pressure injuries, things like middle ear barotrauma can cause a tympanic membrane rupture uh, and face mask squeeze. If you dive too quick, where the, the mask poof, uh, compresses on your face, causes bruising, bloody nose, and some uh, bloodshot eyes. Treatment for this, you give nasal cannula oxygen, get back to a higher pressure. That idea is to boil out nitrogen with the oxygen being 100%. But then also the pressure, such as like with hyperbaric oxygen, the high pressure will squeeze the bubbles down a little bit, uh, either force them back into solution while you breathe off the nitrogen or hopefully make them small enough that they're no longer obstructing blood flow, say to the brain or, or wherever. Um, fortunately, Aster uh, experiencing the skin findings and joint pains is uh, right near a dive shop that knows DCS and looks at their algorithm and they say, all right, illness, we learned from her, let's say mild symptoms come down here, it wasn't really getting any better. And we happen to have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, which looks like this. You go and sit in that bench, they raise up the pressure sure they give you 100% oxygen, you chill for a while, you breathe out your nitrogen, and hopefully you have an improvement of your symptoms. She does, but she knows to wait a day before flying because planes are at a relatively high altitude of pressurization, and you're at risk for the bends again uh, after diving. So she spends the night in Mexico before returning back home to Houston.
So I showed you that pool a moment ago. Uh, this is actually the sidewall of it. So this is actually the top deck. And you can see here that they have a hyperbaric chamber uh, as well as an altitude chamber over here to simulate uh, hypobaric hypoxia. Uh, so people can see how their body responds to high altitude simulations or uh, cockpit decompression. All right, so that is decompression sickness. Question in the chat, Mike. Yeah. Can this be prevented by being careful to come up more slowly, particularly close to the surface? Yep, uh, that's a great question. There's a few different ways to re greatly reduce the risk here. Uh, being um, cautious of how quickly you ascend is pretty big, making sure you're not holding your breath. Uh, but then if you're diving to a certain depth for a certain amount of time, there's kind of like a depth time integration uh, where you're at higher risk because you're having more of the dissolving of the gases. And so divers, when, you, when you're trained from water dives or otherwise, you learn about uh, kind of like these decompression dives where you come up to a certain depth, stay there for a little bit to try and outgas a little bit, come up a little bit more, outgas a little bit. So the deeper you go, the longer your ascent should be. And there's a structured way to do it with charts that people dive with or with dive computers. Uh, and at NASA too, they uh, do very long dives at depth. And so they also use alternative gas mixtures. So you can do things other than just air, um, which uh, often uh, there's a few different formulations, but you can use like, I believe Heliox is one of the ones, but there's some other things you can use that give you less nitrogen. Uh, so that you're at less risk of this happening. It's a great question. I had to be cautious here too, because they have a lot of professional divers and dive masters here at this lab to help mitigate any of these risks. And there's a lot of safety factors in place because they know how to prevent these things. So her dive, the odds of having an accident at the NBL are very, very, very low. I don't know if it happens, honestly, because they know of these things and have procedures in place to protect against them. So her dive was in Mexico. All right. So Aster, it's finally launch day, years of prep and she's sitting right there up at the very top, let's say, gets up to the space station after seven to eight minutes of extreme acceleration, a little bit of more time and getting in position and docking, finally gets to meet her new crewmates, does a few flips out of celebration, but starts to feel a bit sick to her stomach. Uh, her mission commander reminds her uh, about two thirds of crew members actually get space ocean sickness. There's some disequilibrium from it. Uh, your inner ear doesn't really know what to make sense of microgravity. Uh, but uh, it happens to a lot of folks, usually it resolves or improves within a few days. She takes some IM promethazine, which makes her feel a lot better, and she can think more clearly for her work. Uh, you can imagine that having Mallory Weiss tears and microgravity could be a really huge issue. Um, so, but a little bit later, she notices she's got a nagging headache and some sinus congestion, and she's starting to wonder, well, maybe that nausea wasn't space sickness, maybe I'm actually sick. Uh, so I just want to see your thoughts. What do you think is most likely cause of her symptoms here? Uh, could it be something like acid reflux or microgravity, getting a little bit more flux there, allergies? She's in a new environment, uh, just entered the space station. Maybe it's just some benign sinus congestion, a reaction to the medication. She just had the promethazine. I don't know, could not do it. Uh, I just talked about pressure changes. Uh, could she have sinus barotrauma or an infection? And a question in the chat, Mike, while people are answering, can yeah. you get con concussions from the increased G-forces? That is a great question. Uh, you know, I haven't come across that in what I was reading. I, my thought would be unlikely from the launch profiles because I think the higher risk for having a concussion would be a sudden change in acceleration or like impulse. So in these cases, it is a very high one, and especially right at takeoff, it just kind of comes on immediately. So conceivably, you could. They have a lot of safety mechanisms in place. You're sitting in your chair. You're lying on your back. So the initial forces, you're kind of really well contained. But maybe I think more than anything, if you have a sudden, uh, let's say you have an issue where the pod needs to, the escape kind of routines are initiated, there's an extra set of jets that come off and pop your crew capsule off of the rocket uh, launch system. So you're already going to high uh, acceleration and then there needs to be something that can accelerate you suddenly and even more so to get you clear of it in case this explodes. So in that situation, you have a very sudden increase and uh, a lot of the Russian crew landing has been referred to as kind of a controlled auto collision because the landing is not very soft. You hit the ground pretty hard. 
So there's a few situations where you have sudden changes in acceleration that might put you at risk for it. But I'm not, I'm not familiar with any um, concussions. All right, so we see uh, a lot of folks are thinking she's got a sinus infection, which is a great consideration. Uh, in this case, it's gonna actually be benign sinus congestion. I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, this, not that this would change a sinus infection, but all the astronauts before they fly are quarantined for about two weeks, along with their flight doc actually, just so they don't bring anything to the space station. Uh, and during COVID too, they're not as able to get close to family before they fly away. Uh, but that quarantine has been around actually for decades. So in space, though, you have a lot of fluid shifts that occur. Uh, so here's a photo of some cosmonauts sitting for some, uh, I guess, publicity photos. And then here's with them in space. You can see that they have a little bit more of a plethoric look. Um, there's uh, in, on Earth, you have gravity pulling fluid down to your legs. You know, we get venous stasis from folks that sit a lot or are inactive. Uh, normally, though, you have your leg muscles and vascular tone are counteracting those forces to help make it easier for blood supply to get to your brain. Uh, and in space, you basically have that force, but you take away the gravity loading. So now all of a sudden, your body is shooting all this up to your head, and you kind of get a sense of you're hanging upside down by your ankles kind of a thing. Um, so there's also some increased thoracic volume with this. CVP is increased, and there's some transient cardiac effects, your preloading cardiac output, uh, as well as your intravascular volume. Uh, and then there's some data actually to contradict this, but you can kind of use this mental model of uh, there's a counteraction to this where you start having some increased diuresis, reduced thirst to try and re-equilibrate your fluid status. So looking at this figure, you can see this is someone standing on earth. You have gravity pulling fluid down and other forces keeping you from having venous pooling, but in space that shoots all that fluid up, you get stretch receptors saying, I've got too much fluid. So your body starts trying to maintain a new balance and getting rid of that overall body fluid. So overall compared to earth, you're hypovolemic after you adjust and then when you come back to earth, you can have some pretty significant pooling and orthostatic intolerance. So that uh, experience of the individual is actually pretty well reproduced in space. Uh, some of the pathophysiology here, though, they've done extensive testing. It seems like that feedback system isn't quite accurate uh, to describe the effect itself, but the end result is still the same. All right. So just want to comment real quick on, on some life in space. Aster's congestion is getting better after a few days. Uh, she's not really hitting her head on the ceiling, or if that's what you want to call it, so much anymore, uh, and her nausea and brain fog are getting better. Uh, she, like most folks, is using less energy in space because you can imagine if someone lying in a hospital bed is using less energy than sitting in a chair, then walking the unit, this is actually less energy than lying in a bed. Uh, so she's basically living in a bed uh, or worse. So people tend to not eat as much, uh, but then it also seems that there's less intake even more than could be accommodated for that. Uh, some of the thoughts are you have the sinus congestion, even if it is a little residual, that makes food less palatable. Uh, NASA goes through great lengths to prepare meals at their own test kitchen that they freeze dry package up. So some pretty nice camping food, essentially some dehydrated meals. Uh, they take taste preferences into consideration. So you have some things that you enjoy. People tend to use a lot more salt though because they can't taste as much or a lot more hot sauce. Uh, but then also physically your stomach, uh, it, it's working, but the gases in your stomach, let's say you drink something and you have a, a little bit of gas. Uh, on earth, the gas rises to the surface of fluid. And then in your stomach, that allows you to kind of off gas that a little bit in a burp. In Base. I don't know if you guys have seen these videos, but if you have a big ball of fluid and you put, say, an Alka-Seltzer tablet in it, it fills up with foam, essentially, or bubbles, but it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go to the surface. It doesn't go, there's no up to go to. So you just kind of have the whole thing kind of expand a little bit. So if that's happening in your stomach, you're going to get fuller faster, and it's not going to feel like gas. It's just going to feel fullness. Uh, so it may be that people just feel fuller quicker as well. Uh, and then as a part of this too, cut absorption seems to be adjusted. There's a little bit of reduction. Uh, but people also can get constipated, maybe because of drinking less, maybe because of some gravity uh, assist in terms of uh, regularity. Uh, if they're taking antiemetics, some of those can be constipated. So uh, life in space can be a little tricky from that standpoint, especially when this is your toilet. Uh, this is from the space shuttle era. It's a little bit different on the space station right now. There's a seat here with a little hole and a vacuum for collecting solid waste. Uh, 
There's a tube with a funnel here that collects liquid waste, but you sit here best you can, but there's no gravity to hold you down. So you kind of wrap your ankles around here to keep you attached and use these handles so you can actually pull yourself and have a, an appropriate seal. So it's a complicated uh, song and dance here, and you can imagine there's not a whole lot of private space, so it's not for the faint of heart. Either way, she's getting used to it, and things are going like getting busters. Uh, any quick questions before I move on? Yeah, a couple questions. Huh. Uh, one in the chat. Have we studied which bacteria are able to survive in microgravity? That is a great question. I can't comment on it too, too much, but I can say there is a lot of research on this, um, especially because there seems to be some mild immune compromise in space and microgravity, uh, at least on the space station. And there's a lot of reasons that people think that that could be the case, even outside of microgravity. Uh, there's a lot of environmental changes, high CO2 levels, because they have to have engineering systems to extract that. Fluid dynamics are different. Um, anyhow, so there's a lot of bacteria that could form on the walls of the space station. So they have to actually go through and clean quite frequently. And one of the things that is in the um, typical responsibilities for the astronauts is actually going through and swabbing different surfaces, getting air samples, and they actually have air um, uh, sampling uh, systems up there that they can actually use and, and see whether or not there's any sort of gas issues, but then also some signs of infection. So they're constantly monitoring for this. Uh, so there's a lot of plates that they make uh, to search for this. As far as I recall, it's a lot of the same stuff we have here with a few exceptions. I can't tell you what the exceptions are though, unfortunately. And then last question, can people exercise in space? They can. Uh, I'm going to touch on that a little bit more, but that's a pretty integral part of, of the space life. Uh, before getting to that, though, too, just want to point out, Astro is doing experiments on the International Space Station. It's a pretty big role that they have there. It's one of the major contributions of the system. Uh, and today she's excited. She's doing something for some researchers at UW, her alma mater, uh, but it's on crystal formation. Pulls out the 30-page manual on how to get started, but she's noticing that her vision is a bit blurry, which is a new finding for her. So she calls you, her doctor, and you're thinking, well, she had 2020 before she left. Um, so I don't know what's going on, but I'll ask one of her colleagues to get a fundoscopy image and send it down, which they've got the ability to do. So you get these images and I'm asking you folks, what do you see here? Uh, so these are two, you got her uh, right eye on your left and left on your right. And uh, tell me if you're seeing oops, uh, arteriovenous nicking, cotton wool spots, microaneurysm, neovascularization or optic disc edema. There's some arrows there to make it easier or complicate the situation. And there may be more than one thing. All right, so we got uh, let's see, a lot of folks think neovascularization, and then we got a few votes for microaneurysm, AV nicking, and optic disc edema. Uh, so I'm actually going to, let's see here, show you there's some uh, optic disc edema primarily. It's a little hard to appreciate, I think, in, in the best of cases, but you might be able to see here that there's some blurring uh, on this border compared to this border. Uh, and a little bit more nuanced, there's actually a little bit of blurring of the vessels, which may be the easier thing to see in general. Uh, there's also some arrows pointing up here. This is a uh, copper wiring uh, is what this is referred to. It's uh, some arteriolar wall thickening that you often see in chronic hypertension. Uh, so these two findings, you see that, you see some optic disc edema. Uh, it's a bit concerning for intracranial pressure issues on earth. Um, you though are concerned that she might be developing something called space flight associated neuroocular syndrome or SANS. So you ask that same co-astronaut to get an OCT, which they also have on station, and you get the following image. Uh, this is showing the, well, uh, 3D or the topography of the posterior of the eye, and it's showing some choroidal folding or thickening uh, in a uh, linear horizontal fashion, as opposed to, say, idiopathic endocranial hypertension, where you see a bit more concentric. Uh, but you see this and you've confirmed the diagnosis of SANS. Uh, so this is a situation where people have uh, often some globe flattening and some uh, need for reading glasses, uh, 
but you get optic disc edema and choroidal folds, as I mentioned. Uh, and just the mere fact that you have this at all, you can imagine that if intracranial hyper hypertension issues can be, in some cases, life-threatening or at least vision-threatening, uh, you would not want to have that sort of situation in space or on a two-year mission to Mars, uh, both as the risk to the individual, but then also the risk to the rest of the crew if everyone's health is uh, pretty important to the mission success. So understanding this is pretty important. Uh, NASA has invested a lot to try and get a better sense of why this is, uh, but they don't have a clear sense of what's going on just yet. Uh, but what they do know is that there are some brain structural changes in microgravity. So I mentioned the fluid shifts, so you get some venous blood shift like that, but the brain itself actually floats up a little bit. So you get some ventricular volume increase. Uh, that might be, maybe there's some transient CSF outflow obstruction uh, that causes a little bit of trapping. Maybe it has absolutely nothing to do with that. They do see that it appears to be an upward redistribution of CSF fluid though. Uh, and so whether these things cause this or are all experiencing similar phenomena that are related is still a bit unclear, uh, but they think that this could be contributing to it. Uh, and about, uh, I believe 20% of folks that are in space for a prolonged period of time have some self-report of visual acuity changes, whether or not they have this syndrome. Uh, so it seems like it's a fairly common situation. Now, fortunately, Aster's symptoms are pretty minor uh, and pretty well controlled with just having some reading glasses they already had on the station. And fortunately, that turns out to be the case for most people. The diagnostic things that you find often look worse uh, or, or would be associated with worse disease on Earth than the symptoms that people experience, um, which is also kind of puzzling. Uh, and she gets to continue on with her experiments and uses, the, say, this glove box that's currently on the space station. This is a terrestrial mock-up, and they also have a deep freezer here. This is a minus 80 Celsius freezer. Uh, the, there's actually a drawer down here that opens up and has four chambers, and so they can do a lot of life sciences research, uh, basic chemistry and physics research. There's a lot of uh, interesting things that they're working on at all times, uh, including actually a lot of work through UW. I don't know if the microcrystal formation is one that UW is doing in particular, uh, but there's a few projects and, and UW has a pretty long history of working with space research and development. Uh, and Esther is also interested in helping people understand SANS more. Uh, and so she's volunteered to be a part of a study. Uh, this is an astronaut giving himself an ocular ultrasound on the space station. Uh, uh, fortunately, I was uh, a part of a project where we're looking at optic nerve sheath diameter as a metric or a way to monitor or screen for SANS. Uh, on Earth, that's a marker of intr increased intracranial pressure. And so that's an area of interest as well. Um, before moving on, any other questions? Yeah, a question uh, regarding severe illness among astronauts and how that is managed. Severe illness as far as, uh, or I, I suppose anything in particular, or let's say like if they're incapacitated by some illness or another? Yeah, I think potentially if they need to, if like, like a pulmonary embolism. <laughs> Yeah, they need to be well, somewhere with a higher level of care. It's interesting you say that. I didn't put a slide in this, but there was actually a central venous clot, um, idio like just asymptomatic, but observed uh, in flight. And they ended up publishing it. I think this was a knee gym, like within the last year or two. Uh, the question was like, do you like bring them back uh, or is it safe to bring them back? Do you anticoagulate them? Uh, so they always have the option of having an evac. Essentially, it would like essentially if you're well enough that you can survive a, a re-entry. They have a capsule always available for an emergency egress, and you can be back on the ground in like literally like minutes. Um, so there is always that major uh, escape option, but you have to be safe enough to leave. And they have done some things to try and figure out, you know, if someone needed surgery in space, could you do it? If someone needed CPR in space, could you do it? Uh, and they did develop a way to do chest compressions instead of, you know, leaning over and pushing down, you're actually pushing overhead with your feet on the other side of the spacecraft. Uh, and they've never needed to use it, uh, but supposedly it's a lot more um, easier to do because you're actually using, you know, your leg muscles, not your, your upper body. So, so reportedly the astronauts said that they felt that they could do many, many rounds of chest compressions more than they would be able to on Earth. So there's an emergency escape option, but you're, I don't know, hoping for the best in a way. And if <clears throat> people are doing missions to the moon, uh, there's a planned mission for making a space station uh, near the moon or say to Mars, you, you miss out on a lot of things. And so there's inherently an increased risk. Uh, 
a great question. All right, so I've got a few more minutes. I wonder, I've got some things I could talk about here, <clears throat> but maybe it would be best is to do a little overview. And if people have specific questions, the slides will be present. And then I can also address them specifically if we have a little bit extra time. Sounds good. So <clears throat> one of the things that I wanted to mention is there's a poll here that I'm going to skip. Oh, pardon me. <clears throat> but astronauts are at increased risk for kidney stones uh, too. There's some pretty significant bone and muscle atrophy. Uh, there's no loading. And so six months in space for a man is equivalent to 20 years of bone loss. Uh, and for women, it's six times as bad as postmenopausal rates. Um, within a few days, you can see increased urinary calcium. Within a week, you can see a measurable change in calcaneal bone mineral density. And then after about 60 days, there's about 7.5% reduction in um, BMD to calcaneus. They've done a few studies to try and understand this. Uh, PTH levels have varied. Uh, they do see there's reduced GI absorption of calcium. Maybe there's a calcium vitamin D metabol or metabol uh, metabolism component of this. Uh, but either way, resistive exercise, there's a question about exercise, uh, works really well to help prevent decline. So you can actually keep leg uh, atrophy and bone loss within a 10% loss. Uh, so here they have a squat rack on the, on the space station. You can also use this to do bench presses and bicep curls and, and a few other things. There's a treadmill on the space station. Someone a few years ago actually did a marathon in space virtually, uh, I believe it was the London Marathon, uh, but you have to have a harness and bungees to keep you from floating off. And then there's also this little thing over here, uh, which is a stationary bike. You notice there's no seat. Uh, this particular person is strapped just to, to this back rod so they don't float away like forward, but there's no seat because it doesn't need to be and you can bike in space. Uh, these work pretty well. Uh, but you can imagine they're big, heavy, bulky. So if you needed to go very great distances, it's very expensive to ship things in a way. So looking for things that are more lightweight is pretty important, or if there's medical things you can do. Uh, they've studied a few different medications, including bisphosphonates. It seems that the bisphosphonates work the best to try and boost the effect of resistive exercise. There are some like moderate gains uh, or improvements in bone, uh, reducing bone loss. But oddly enough, when they check uh, a year later, uh, you actually have lost all those. So your, your uh, kind of Kappelmeyer curves kind of reconvene. Uh, so whether this is actually more of an issue with microstructure changes in architecture, like uh, Anisha was talking about, uh, versus the overall density and what exactly is going on, because again, the loading is, is different, much different. Um, and so maybe the metrics that you're using to uh, monitor bone loss are not the same as you would on earth. And oddly enough too, the fracture risk doesn't seem to be increased despite these bone loss uh, reductions. I think the only reported uh, fracture after being in space was actually related to like a skiing accident or automobile accident. It didn't quite fit for having uh, like an abnormal pathologic fracture. So it seems like it's a big issue with atrophy, especially, but maybe not in the ways that we're used to thinking about it. And so you can imagine it's kind of a brave new world to understand this. Uh, I might leave that as the last case, uh, but just point out that on recovery, uh, people often have generalized weakness, orthostatic intolerance, and a lot of sensory motor deconditioning. Your inner ear has to re-equilibrate to being in gravity. Uh, and position sense, uh, nausea is often expected. The docs actually help recover the astronauts and treat them immediately after. Um, but recovery can take hours, days, weeks, months. And for bone loss, it can take twice as long as the mission duration. So a six month mission, you can see the effects of it for over a year or longer. Um, there's also been some studies looking at the orth orthostatic intolerance. There's a lot of LV atrophy over those uh, space missions. But when they do metrics to try and boost that, uh, they don't actually see any change in orthostatic intolerance post-return. So more and more, it's actually looking like, in addition to leg strength, kind of counteracting the um, uh, uh, gravity force and fluid shifting. Uh, it may actually be, it looks like autonomic tone is still intact. The barrow reflex is actually still appropriately strong, but there might be a mismatch in that feedback and like the timing is off in a sense, uh, as well as the leg strength and hypovolemia playing a role. Um, it's just interesting that the pathophysiology doesn't quite align with what you might expect. 
Other things still have to discover, uh, radiation exposure is a big area of research. It's really hard to recreate the space radiation milieu on Earth. Uh, there's solar flares, there's cosmic rays from other galaxies, there's heavy iron radiation. Um, there's just a lot of considerations there. Uh, but then also the crew are in a hypercarbic environment because they have to scrub out all that CO2 and it's very challenging. So they're used to being in environments as much as like 10, 10 times the amount of CO2 on the Earth. Uh, but then for docs, you got to figure out how do you keep people safe in all these environments and ones we don't yet understand, but then how do you construct a medical kit, say for someone going to Mars, how do you pick which equipment is actually worth the, the money and effort and fuel to go uh, if you may never use it. Uh, and then also, what do you treat and how do you treat it, because is it worth using an entire medical kit to treat one person's injury if it means that no one can have any treatments for the rest of the mission. So you have to make some pretty difficult resource allocation decisions up front uh, in terms of constructing your, your medical kit. And if you're interested in learning more, uh, there's a professional organization, ASMA or ASMA. They have a good website here, and there's a resident organization, AMSRO, that has a few seminars available. Uh, then there's also some courses that you can do. NASA has an aerospace medicine clerkship. All these are available, whether you're a med student up through an attending. You apply it's four weeks every April and October. I did this as a med student, so let me know if you have any questions. And UTMB in Texas has a, a similar a program uh, every July for four weeks. I was able to do this as an unlisted or independent elective this past summer. Um, and there, so ask me if you have any questions on that too. Uh, there's some great seminars available online, podcasts, and of course the fellowship training. So we're at 45 minutes there and I know it's a little bit of a late start. Um, as, if there's any questions, I'm happy to kind of chat a little bit more offline or after folks have left. Uh, and then again, there's a few extra slides that would be available for your reference. But thank you for your attention, everybody. Mike, thank you so much. This was a fantastic talk and I think brought together some of the other points from our prior talks also. Yeah. Um, so definitely um, folks reach out to Mike if you have questions or if you are now newly inspired to, to pursue space medicine or aviation medicine. We have a question in the chat from Cody. What's your favorite space movie, Mike? Uh, oof, that's a good one. Uh, I mean, Interstellar probably right now. That was, that was a pretty darn good movie. First Man is also a really good one if you are interested in the Apollo era.